with us. Hopefully you will love the process. Um, the process of getting a mortgage isn't the easiest process. And National Association of Realtors says that 65% of the people that go through the home buying process aren't excited about the process. Here at Cross Country Mortgage, we do everything in our power to make the process as smooth and seamless as possible. So because it is Valentine's Day and you're spending some time with us, we did talk about the fact that we would be entering you into a drawing today. So here's our drawing filled with some goodies that my team put together. And as you sign on, I am taking your name and putting your name at the bottom of the jar. And at the end of um, the class, I will pick uh, the winner. So really appreciate you coming here today. I do have a presentation that I go through. Um, none of this is scripted. This is my 22 years of experience poured into, you know, as quickly as we can get this done on Valentine's Day, which is about 30 to 45 minutes with some Q&A. Um, but I do this because I want you guys to be educated on the process. Typically, when we pre-approve you, we go through quite a bit. We go through your financials. We go through what it looks like to get you pre-approved. We run you numbers. We give you guys options. But at the end of the day, we don't talk high-level mortgage business. So this is to educate you a little bit more on the high-level mortgage business. And then each particular customer that we pre-approve has their own um, scenario that we have to work through. There are really no two scenarios that work the same, as crazy as that may sound, but there's so many different variations. So appreciate you being here. If you're looking to buy a house, you're in the right spot. Um, we're doing this home class. I am your home purchase expert. I've been doing this, like I said, for 22 years. I am a branch leader, which means that I have some folks that work under me on the sales capacity. And of course, I have operational folks that work for me as well. Um, we are a lender that is licensed in all 50 states. So if you or your family or friends were buying anywhere, not just in Connecticut, we can help you. Um, all right, so let's have a little bit of fun. For some of you, this might be a stressful process going through the mortgage process. For some of you, it might be a fun process. For some of you, it might be financially stressful or just work stressful, but we wanna make this fun. We wanna make your mortgage process as easy as possible. So ask questions and um, put them in the chat box. Actually, I should say, put them in the Q&A box. That's where I'll be reviewing questions. Um, I will be answering them as we go forward. And then we'll clean up any questions at the end. A few of the things we're going to talk about is renting versus owning. We're going to talk about planning. We're going to talk about the finances. We're going to talk about the logistics. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about mortgage products. We're going to talk a little bit about interest rates and what I feel is going to happen this year. I don't have the crystal ball, but we're going to dive into quite a bit. And again, ask questions in that Q&A box. Okay. Renting versus owning. So let's talk about renting versus owning very, very quickly here. As a um, tax paying citizen, you get a standardized deduction. But when you buy a house, your deduction, so your write off against your income, becomes higher because now you have property taxes and you have uh, mortgage interest. So there are tax benefits to buying a home um, that would apply to you. You would build equity and wealth. And what I say to people often is when you rent a home, if you rent a home, you can do the calculation of how much you spend over five years of renting. But when you walk away at the end of five years, what do you walk away with? You walk away with your security deposit and that's about it. But when you buy a home and you start paying mortgage and you start paying down your mortgage, at the end of five years, you're gonna walk away with your equity minus your sale costs, of course, but that's gonna be larger than your security deposit in the majority of the cases, okay? In my 22 year career, the only time that we've had the values where they were declining was the 2008 mortgage and financial crisis. So that was a financial crisis coupled with a mortgage crisis because mortgage regulations prior to 2008 were basically almost non-existent, okay? Uh, buying allows you the pride of home ownership, being able to put a roof over your head for yourself, your family, your guests, et cetera, and you own that home. It gives you stability and it's your rules. If you want to paint those walls yellow, you can paint those walls yellow. If you want to have a dog in your current place that you rent doesn't allow dogs, you can have a dog. It's yours to do what you want to do with. Okay. All right. So um, when I talk with clients, we are putting together a mortgage plan for them. 
Sometimes they've talked to a realtor on the front end, sometimes they've not. But what really happens in this process is you have two sides to the equation. You have the emotional side of the equation and you have the financial side of the equation, okay? The emotional side of the equation relative to, oh my gosh, I'm so excited, I'm gonna be buying this home. Or I love this house, can I make an offer? You know, whatever the case may be. But then oftentimes the stressful side comes into the financial side of it. So a lot of you on this call have already been pre-approved by me. If you've not been pre-approved by me, get pre-approved before you go out shopping for a home. If you have friends and family that are looking to get into the mortgage market or the real estate market, have them get in touch with me first. The worst thing that can happen is you go out, you look at a house, you emotionally fall in love with it, and then you go get pre-approved and find out you can't afford it or you don't like the payment, whatever it may be. But feed both of those sides, the emotional side and the financial side. And the financial side, you want to feed by getting prepared with a mortgage on the front end, okay? The emotional side is typically fed by what you see. Um, and oftentimes, um, there's gonna be an option that you're gonna love in the market, okay? Um, why are you deciding to buy right now? If you're a renter, is your rent going up? I don't know about you guys, but I've seen rents go up 30, 40, 50% in some cases. I think the national average was in the, like the low double digits last year. I don't know where we are today. But I will tell you, locally, I am still hearing that rental rates are going up, okay? So with a mortgage, when you buy a house and take out a mortgage, the only thing that generally would change is your, in, your insurance, because insurance always goes up, that's homeowner's insurance, um, and your taxes when the town reassesses. Other than that, your mortgage payment is going to stay level um, for out for 30 years, as long as you do a 30-year fixed, okay? Okay. Um, is your family growing? Is that why you're buying? Is that, you know, are you going from a rental into a uh, purchase because your family's growing? Are you in a home right now and you're just expanding your home to a larger home because you're having more children, you're taking in your in-laws, whatever the case may be, there are changes that cause people um, to buy homes. Um, do you wanna buy a house to build some equity? Are you moving for work? During this pandemic, we've seen people now be allowed to work anywhere in the country. And I'm sure you've seen that too. So a lot of people have moved into various parts of the country because they've been allowed to work in various parts of the country. So once again, cross country can help in all 50 states if you know anyone at all. Typically the requirement, if you're moving, let's say from California to Connecticut, we had a teacher, believe it or not, a teacher moved from California to Connecticut. And I said, okay, now she was in management, but she still was at a school. I said, all right, your boss is going to have to write you a letter that says you can live in Connecticut, even though the school is in California. And we were able to make that work. So a lot of people move for work these days. How long do you plan on staying in the home? That's a question that can help us tailor your mortgage needs. It's also a question that can help us decide whether buying is the right thing for you. If you're, if you're going to buy and maybe not be there for more than 12 months, Maybe it's not the right idea. 16 months, 18 months, maybe it's not the right idea because while let's just say Fairfield County, for example, Connecticut, over the next 12 months, they're talking about a 4.7% increase in appreciation, which is great. But if you have to sell your house and you're paying 5% to the realtor plus conveyance tax, a year may not be enough time. You may lose money. So we'll go through everything based upon what you tell us is your timeline. Um, the typical timeline these, day, these days today is someone is typically in their mortgage for about 10 years, mortgage home in 10 years, okay? Um, are you purchasing with a partner or someone you're confident in sharing this commitment with? If you're purchasing with a spouse or significant other um, that, you're, you know, that you're married to, that's one thing. If you're purchasing with someone you're not married to, um, do you have to have a discussion with uh, you know, an attorney about that just in case things break down a little bit? So you want to make sure you look into all those things. And then how much work are you willing to put into home, right? Um, are you looking to just do some, some hardwood floors and some painting, or are you looking to do a renovation? We do offer renovation loans here at Cross Country Mortgage, so that's just something else to think about. Now, what I also want you guys to think about is don't just look for the house that's finished. So for example, if you're in a $600,000 price point and you can't find anything in the $600,000 price point, 
maybe you should open up your price search to a four or 450 range, 450,000, which I know you might be scratching your head saying, why is he telling me to go lower? But maybe you go to 450,000 and, and consider putting 100 to 150,000 into the house for renovation. And then you fix the house to where you want it to be. So that's something that you could also consider. Okay, now I like to go through these bullets here of what lenders look at when they are qualifying you for a home loan. When we, as a mortgage loan originator at the front end, look at your file, what are we looking at? And then what is the underwriter who's behind us looking at? So they're looking at your credit, okay? They're making sure that you have a great credit score. They're making sure that you've paid your bills on time. They're making sure that you don't have any major derogatory items that haven't been seasoned long enough. So let's say you had a foreclosure last year, that could be a challenge. So they're really diving into your credit. The number one thing is the score, okay? The number two thing is looking at debts and things of that nature, okay? I'm gonna skip over the monthly survival number now and just go right to cash. Cash would be, what do you have in checking, savings, brokerage, retirement, et cetera? Those numbers can be very helpful for us in determining down payment and closing costs if you have enough money. And then once you close on the home, do you have any reserves in the bank? Okay. So you let's say your down payment and closing costs are $100,000. Okay. You pay that at closing. And let's say the program that you are going with requires reserves. Okay. Some do, some don't. A lot of the first time homebuyer programs do not require reserves. A lot of the first time homebuyer programs do not require reserves. But the jumbo mortgage loans, which are 727,000 or higher. So I'm going to say that again. Any loan 727,000 or higher is a jumbo mortgage in this country. Okay. We would oftentimes need reserves for loans like that. Not every time, oftentimes. Okay. So we are going to look at your cash. If you don't need reserves, if you're a first time buyer and you don't need reserves, we're going to make sure you have the down payment and the closing costs. Okay. Or are you getting gift to subsidize down payment and closing costs? And if you're in the jumbo price point, again, a loan over 727, we will reserve you, we will review your reserves to make sure you have enough. Okay. The next next uh, characteristic they look at is your income, your income and your debt to income ratio. These two right here go hand in hand. We're looking at your income. Do you have consistent earning history? Do you make a W-2 or do you have a 1099? Are you a salaried employee or hourly? Do you get bonus? Do you get commission? So hourly, bonus, and commission, we typically, but not always, need a two-year history of those items to use them for qualifying. So typically, but not always, okay? We look at your debt-to-income ratio to make sure you qualify, okay? The last item on this page that I will talk about is your monthly survival, survival number, which is basically your budget. And I will give you a budget after this presentation if you'd like one. But basically, you want to sit down and look at what it costs you to live every single month and how a new mortgage will factor into that. Okay. The last piece that's not on this slide that an underwriter will review, but is not pertinent to anything that you've done is we will review an appraisal. So we will do an appraisal on the house to make sure the house values at the price you're paying and also to make sure that the house is in a condition that we can lend on, okay? So we wanna make sure the house is in good condition because think about it, when you finance a home loan or when you take out a home loan and the bank finances your house, typically the bank is financing, let's just say 80% and you're putting your 20% equity in. So they want to make sure the house is completed, it's in good shape, and it comes in at the purchase price. But you want to make sure that too, because you want to make sure not overpay, unless you intended to overpay, which sometimes that does happen. Okay, next slide. What makes up your credit score? So first and foremost, there's different types of credit scoring models out there. FICO is what lenders use, F-I-C-O, which is the Fair Isaac and Company model, okay? That's what we use as lenders. There are other scores out there like consumer credit scores. You also hear of things like Credit Karma. That is not a FICO score. We as lenders use FICO scores. We look at three scores, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. We take your middle score, 
okay? A FICO score ranges from 350 to 850, and it takes in a bunch of characteristics of your um, credit, okay? So here's what it takes into account. 10% of your score is based upon new credit. 10% of your score is based upon the type of credit you use. So that would be installment loan, um, mortgage, revolving, things of that nature. 15% um, is the length of credit history. 30% is the amount you owe. And 35% is your payment history. So are you paying on time? As far as this amounts you owe, 30% waiting, if you have a credit card with a $10,000 balance, the best percentage of utilized credit to keep your scores as great as you possibly can keep them is less than 50%. So simply put, if you have a $10,000 limit, try to keep your balance $5,000 or less to get the best score, okay? If you have to max out your card for a large purchase, make sure you pay that down right away, okay? Length of credit, 15%. The longer you have credit, the higher your scores are going to be as long as you're paying on time. So for me, I have an American Express that I've had for over 20 years. I was thinking about closing that American Express and opening a new one. My credit advisor, who I can introduce you guys to if you need someone, said to me, Jay, don't shut it down. You're going to lose 20 years of history. If anything, leave it open. Yes, pay the annual Amex fee and get a separate card, but don't shut it down. You'll lose all of that 22 years worth of history. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to mention is if you're looking at a consumer score or a credit karma score and you're looking at a FICO score, your consumer credit score is going to be like 100 points higher than the FICO score. It's just the way the models are built. Okay. So if you have an 800 credit karma score, but you have a 730 FICO score, it's just because they're different models. Okay. FICO number five is what mortgage uses. What do I mean by number five? It's the version number. FICO, I believe, is up to version 10 right now. I've been doing this for 22 years, like I mentioned. We've always used FICO 5. The mortgage business has always used FICO 5, okay? The best scores, guys, are over 740. The worst scores are below 639, okay? The higher the score, the better the interest rate in most cases, not all cases. The lower the score, the more likelihood we would go with a more flexible lending option like FHA or VA. Okay, VA is a veteran's loan for a veteran. Okay, a few quick tips, pay your bills on time. Don't open new credit lines. If you need to open a new credit card, please talk to us first. I would prefer you wait until after you close. Do not ever max out your credit cards. If you have to, you have to, but try not to. Um, if you have to max it out for a large purchase, pay it down pretty quickly. And then, like I said earlier, keep older credit lines open. Guys, as a reminder, please post any questions in the Q&A. Okay, so real quick here, cross-country mortgage tip. One in five Americans find errors in their credit reports, okay? One in five Americans find errors in their credit reports. Guys, this is very common. I find it all the time. So here's what I'm going to recommend to you guys. Take a pen and paper. I'll give you a few seconds here. Take a pen and paper, and I want you to write something down. I'll say it a few times. Annualcreditreport.com. www.annualcreditreport.com. Okay? Go to annualcreditreport.com. It's a government-sponsored site. You can pull your credit there. You enter your information. You pull credit. It is free. It does not affect your credit rating because it's a consumer driven or consumer pulled report. You're pulling your report on yourself. We're not pulling it. Okay. You can get a report. You have to pay for the scores, which you don't really have to get the scores. What you really want to look at is you want to look through the data and see if there is any errors. Okay. And you want to get those errors removed. I see errors all the time. Okay. Here is your monthly survival number form or sheet, better known or simply known as a budget, okay? Um, what you want to do is you want to take this form and you want to enter in what is your current rent or what is your proposed mortgage, what are you paying for auto, student loans, credit cards, et cetera, and you want to figure out what your budget looks like and how it's going to work for you and potentially your savings or your survival number, whatever it may be, I'm happy to review your budgets with you, but this is a good way if nothing else, to bring to light what you're spending your money on. Now, 
I always tell people, you want to make sure after you buy a house, you're not eating ramen and peanut butter and jelly every night. Now, if any of you like ramen and peanut butter and jelly, that's not a knock against those two food groups, but they tend to be, you know, less expensive foods, sometimes foods that I think about what I ate at college. We don't want you to get into a situation where you're feeling stressed. Now, I will tell you, we do a thorough underwrite of your loan, and we would tell you if we thought you were getting to your max budget or if we think you should be careful. That doesn't mean you shouldn't buy a home. The bottom line is you need to be comfortable with the home you're buying and the amount of money you're spending each month. This will help you do that. You have to make the decision, but this will help you do it. Okay, I'm gonna pause real quick and take a look at any questions. Um, does having reserves hurt in relation to qualifying for a first-time home buyer program? The answer is no. Having reserves does not affect your ability to get a first-time home buyer loan. Some first-time home buyer loans are limited based upon your income. Some first-time home buyer loans are not based upon your income. Um, here's what I will tell you though, that um, not every loan has to be a first-time buyer loan to get the best loan. For example, if you're not a first-time home buyer, that doesn't mean you're getting a terrible loan. If you're not a first-time home buyer, that doesn't mean you're not eligible for some of the similar loans that a first-time home buyer is. There are very few opportunities um, for first-time home buyers to get loans that others can't get. So there's a few, but it's not like there's a thousand, okay? Um, how do credit scores factor in when purchasing with a spouse? Is it an average of the two? Great question. It's not an average of the two. It's the lower of the two. So let's say, again, we use three scores, TransUnion, Equifax, Experian, the middle of the three scores. So if, if you had a 700, a 720, and a 750, your middle score is a 720. If your spouse has a 690, a 710, and a 720, their middle score is a 710, which is the lowest of the two middle scores. We go by that middle score. So it's the lower of the two middle scores for each borrower, okay? After looking at them for each borrower, okay? Um, okay, now let's talk about some programs that we have. We have your conventional loans, we have your government loans, which are your FHA, VA, and USDA, and we have your jumbo loans, okay? Your conventional loans are your run-of-the-mill Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. You guys probably have all heard those names. Um, those are the, you know, the agency loans, and we can get you those loans down to 3% down up to 726200 That is the new conforming loan limit, 726200 Okay, so 3% down up to 726 and 100% of the funds can be can be gifted for down payment and closing costs. Government loans, that's your FHA, your VA, and your USDA. Working backwards, USDA, just think rural. That's your rural housing loan. You can do that with as little as 0% down. There is a USDA rural housing website that you can go to to search addresses to see if it's in a rural zone. VA is for veterans. You can do 0% down even on a million dollar purchase, okay? That's for your veteran. Um, and then you have the FHA, which goes as low as 3.5% down. So that's 3.5% down payment. With all these programs, 100% of the funds can come from gift for down payment and closing costs, okay? Jumbo financing, so that's any loan that's over the 726 becomes a jumbo. You can go with as little as 5% down and 100% of the funds can be gift, okay? The two products uh, or three products that I don't have on the screen that I will just kind of brush over and talk quickly about are new construction. We can do new construction up to the $726,000 loan amount with as little as 5% down. We can do renovation. So again, like I said at the beginning, if you find that $400,000 house, you know, and put $200,000 of renovation into it, we can do um, those products as well with as little as three or three and a half percent down. And then last but not least, if you know a senior over six, anyone over 62 that is considering a reverse mortgage, that's a mortgage where they take a mortgage out on their property and they do not have a payment, it's reverse and that your balance goes up versus your balance going down. So if you know anyone who might need something like that, we can help them there too. Okay, um, 
Here is a rent versus buy scenario that I put together. If I've pre-approved you already and we've gone through scenarios, you've seen this, but this is the tool and that, that I use to present options. So in this case, I did a scenario of someone buying for 30, or renting for 3,500 versus buying for 500,000 with 10% down. And what we were showing them was the difference between their total payment as a purchaser versus as a renter. You can see their tax benefit here was $820 as a, as a home buyer versus 245 as a renter. They were paying down some principal every month by way of you know, the loan amortization. So we use this kind of scenario to present and say, okay, Mr. Smith, you're renting right now. You're looking at purchasing. Here's the difference between the two. And we break it down and we go through it with them. I'll stop and talk about interest rates quickly here. As you can see on this screen, this was built back in November of 2015. The interest rate at that time was 6.99, okay? The lowest rates have been, since rates shot up in 2022, the lowest rates have been was actually just two weeks ago on February 1st, when the Fed announced that the prime rate was going up again. Um, that caused mortgage rates to drop. From that time to today, though, rates have gone right back up. I expect the first half of this year to be volatile. And then second half of this year or next year, we are going to see rates come down. So a few things. If you find the perfect house and you can afford it, whether rates are 6.5 or 6.99, you should buy that house, okay? As long as you can afford it, you should buy that house. Why? If it's the perfect house and it fits your needs, grab it. You can always refinance down the road. Why miss out on the perfect opportunity just because rates are higher? Because we know you can refinance later. Additionally, as the market progresses this year and when rates start to come down, home values will start to go up again. It's going to happen. Mark my words, okay? Reason being is, if rates go down by, let's say, 1%, and let's say 1% allows a buyer to buy $100,000 more in home value, what does that mean? Every buyer in the $200,000 range becomes a two fifty dollars to $300,000 buyer. Every home buyer in the three hundred dollars goes up and up and up. Every buyer at $800,000 becomes a million-dollar buyer. What does that do? That puts pressure on different price points, and you will start to see people bidding on homes with multiple bids, releasing contingencies, you name it, like what we saw in 2020 and 2021. And by the way, we're seeing it right now. 26 showings on one property on a Sunday, 13 offers. So guys, if you're thinking, should I wait for rates to come down to buy? I do not believe that is the best strategy at all. I would advise my sister to do that. Okay, so any questions on that, post them in the Q&A or ask me offline. Okay, uh, typical closing costs. You know, everyone always wants a percentage of the purchase price. I'm going to tell you guys, 2 to 5% of the purchase price might be a good number for closing costs. The reality is, guys, I want to calculate those closing costs for you, put my 20 years to good use for you and show you what the number is. But if you really had to figure it out, you can use a 2 to 5% number. Here is a breakdown of estimated closing costs. Home inspection. You're going to be connected with a home inspector via your realtor. It's going to be anywhere from 300 to a few grand. That depends on the price of the home. Appraisal, $350 to $1,000. Depends on the price of the home. Homeowner's insurance. You always have to pay one year of homeowner's insurance in advance. So I'm estimating $600 to $1,800. And again, it really just depends. If you're buying a $5 million house, your insurance is going to be much more than one point uh, than $1,800 than if you're buying a $200,000 house, okay? Um, lender fees, that's um, processing and underwriting, probably about $1,500. And then title and attorney. Title insurance and attorney's fees are going to be quoted from your attorney. I am estimating $3.85,000 for title insurance. So if you're buying a million dollar home, that's $3,850, okay? Attorney's fees, somewhere between $750 and $2,000. And then you always have to pay prepaid taxes when you close on a home. That starts your escrow account. Now, for those of you who've been pre-approved with me, I've gone through these in great length. For those of you who have not been pre-approved by me, once we get you pre-approved, we will go through these numbers in great length and break them all down for you. So don't get too concerned today, okay? Uh, let me just check the Q&A box here. Um, 
Is there a limit to the number of times or how frequently you can refinance? Great question. No, you can refinance as many times as you want. The only loans right now that have prepayment penalties and they're at will prepayment penalties are investment properties. So if you're an investor and you're buying an investment property, you can opt for a prepayment penalty for a lower rate. Outside of investment loans, there are no prepayment penalties. You can refinance as much as you want. Cross Country Mortgage right now is offering that if you buy a home with us between January 1st of 2023 and, and April 15th of 2023, so two more months, within the first four months of this year, and you refinance with us before December of 2025, so we're assuming rates go down in the next two years, we will credit that $1,500 in lender uh, fees, which is your uh, processing and underwriting, okay? All right, income. We talked about income before. We take a two-year history. If it's um, if it's variable income, hourly bonus commission. If you are a W-2 salaried employee, we just take a 12-year 12 12-year um, 12 average. If you're self-employed, we're going to dig into those tax returns and we're going to look at the tax returns and look at your cash flow. If you don't qualify, for a full income verification loan, meaning by looking at your tax returns, you're self-employed, you don't qualify. We do qualify people now based upon revenue in their bank statements. So it is a safe way of qualifying a self-employed borrower because we're looking at the revenue in their bank statements, which doesn't often reflect the net income in their tax return. Okay. If you're going to make a job change during the process of buying a home, please let us know. It's not always the worst thing. As long as we talk about it up front, everything will be fine. Okay. Debt to income ratio. When we talked about earlier, what is the mortgage business? What do underwriters look at? They look at your debt to income ratio. They take your monthly recurring payments that would show up on your credit report, student loans, car payments, credit cards, et cetera, plus the proposed housing payment. That is your principal and interest tax and insurance. They divide that by your gross income. We don't want that to be greater than 43%. So if you make $10,000 a month gross, that's $120,000 yearly salary. You want your monthly payments for mortgage and other expenses to be $4,300 or less. Now, that is a rough general rule. There are exceptions to that where we can go to 49% or 45% without exception. So there are, that's not a hard and fast 43, but generally speaking, the mortgage business has this number 43% as your debt to income ratio. That just means 50% of your money goes towards everything else, taxes, savings, entertainment, grocery, pocket cash, okay? Um, keeping your debt to income ratio low will help you ensure you can afford the debt repayments. So basically, we want to make sure that you guys aren't getting yourselves in trouble and that you're going to be able to afford and continue to pay your monthly expenses. Okay. So we're looking out for your best interest. We talked about this earlier, but uh, what is, what is your payment made up of principal interest taxes, insurance, and then the additional items that can be applicable are mortgage insurance. If you don't put 20% down and your homeowners association dues, if you're buying in a, uh, in an HOA. So that's a condo or a single family that's part of a community. Okay, let's go through the home buyer roadmap and who you're going to be working with. The typical people that you would work with in the uh, process is me, your loan officer. I should really be your first phone call. However, the real estate agent is usually the first phone call because they have the bright, shiny object. Um, then we enlist an appraiser to appraise the home. Um, you would hire an attorney. We can recommend someone for you. If you're buying in the state of Connecticut, the attorney handles the title work. Most other states, the title company also represents you. You're going to hire a home inspector to inspect the property, and you're obviously going to get an insurance agent so you can uh, get your insurance. Now, there's other people that may come into the process. Let's say you have a home inspector out, and the home inspector says, hey, I want you to get a structural engineer in here, or I want you to get an HVAC uh, representative in here. So these are the main people that would be part of your transaction, but it's not limited to these folks. Um, when should I meet with my lender? There really is no perfect time necessarily, because in this market, the, the buying cycle is longer because there's less inventory, but the best time is now. Meaning if you are thinking about buying a home, you should get in touch with a lender. Why? 
We just met with a woman the other day. She cannot buy a home right now. Her credit needs repair. If she didn't come to me, I wouldn't have been able to guide her or affiliate her with someone that can help her repair her credit. So we've gotten her to a path now. She probably won't be buying for another year. Um, but just because you think everything is great, don't wait, okay? Uh, quick story. Years ago, my friend came to me after college and said, I want to buy a house. I want to get pre-approved. Okay, let's get you your application in. We get his application in. His credit is an absolute disaster. I had a tough time going to talk to him because he was a good friend of mine, but I had to. And I said, what happened? Make a long story short, someone stole his identity. He had no clue. We had to help him clean that up. It took about three months of hard work um, to get all those things removed. So get in touch with a lender right away. We do a soft credit check here at Cross Country Mortgage, which means it's not going to be a hard inquiry on your credit report. And we can do a pre-approval on almost any loan. About 90% of the loans we fund, we can use a soft credit pull. But no matter what, if you're starting the process with us, we can do a soft credit pull. And then if you decide you're going forward and we need to do the hard credit pull at some point, we can do that. So don't fear meeting with us because of credit. And it's never too early. Okay. What's the difference between a pre-qualification letter and a pre-approval letter? Well, here's what I'll tell you. Pre-qualification letters are really a thing of the past, at least in the markets that I work in. A pre-qualification letter can be done with basically no supporting documentation and sometimes not even a credit check. What we do here is a pre-approval. We look at your income, we look at your assets, we look at your credit, we do an initial underwriting screening, um, and we issue you a pre-approval based upon the information you've given us and your credit report. By doing the pre-approval, you know your budget and we've reviewed that. You know if your buying power has to be adjusted. You know what pitfalls or setbacks might come your way and you've saved a bunch of time. Here's what I would not want to happen and I see this happen all the time, guys. Talk to a customer this week and they say, you know, Jay, I'm not gonna apply right now. I'm gonna wait. They happen to go out on Saturday to just browse around. They browse around and they find the beautiful home and they want to make an offer. Guess what happens? Now they have to apply. Myself or my team have to jump in. We have on-call weekend hours. We don't mind jumping in, but it becomes much more stressful than if you just get pre-approved and spend the time before you go out looking for a house. In this market, when you have 13 offers on one house, you don't want to be the 13th offer to the table. You want to try to be at the front end or somewhere there, but you don't want to be scrambling to be that last offer that hits the table. Okay, so get prepared and do it in advance. Here's a, a general list of some documents that we might ask for you or of you. Pay stubs, tax returns, bank statements, photo ID, and of course, we'll do your credit check. Okay, this is just a generic list of documents that we might ask for. Um, okay, now. Once we've got you pre-approved, you're going to meet with your, that's my preference, right? Or you're going to meet with your realtor to talk about the market, to talk about what you want, um, to talk about, you know, whatever your criteria are. You're going to go out and you're going to shop with your lender. You're going to drive around on the weekend or during the week and find that perfect home. And then you're going to make an offer. We will issue you a pre-approval that matches your offer. So if you're pre-approved for 600000 but you're offering 575 on a property, we're going to tailor that letter to match the offer price. Okay. We don't want to let a seller know you're pre-approved for 600 when you're bidding 575. Let's not give up your cards. Okay. Once you negotiate a price and have an accepted offer, you're going to set up the home inspection. You're going to let us know you have an accepted offer. We're going to start putting your file together and getting it ready uh, for the next steps. Okay. Um, home buyers, do's and don'ts. Please inform us of any changes to your employment or your compensation during the process. If you happen to go from full salary to full commission during the middle of the process, that could literally kill your deal. So please let us know of any changes to employment or compensation. Continue to always pay your bills no matter what until the day of closing and, of course, beyond. Um, keep a paper trail if you move funds from account to account and try not to move funds unless you have to and run it by us. Notify us of any changes in your finances 
and or any travel plans that might keep you out of the country or inaccessible for a while. The don'ts, don't quit your job. We've had it happen, trust me. Don't co-sign for anyone. Don't transition from employment without talking to us. Don't close out any credit cards, like I said, because if you close out a credit card during the process, by the way, and we have to re-pull your credit for whatever reason, and your score drops, that could um, disqualify you from the loan. Don't max out any credit cards and try not to move funds around. It'll just require more work on your part. Um, underwriting and appraisal. We are ordering the appraisal as soon as you have an accepted offer, unless you tell us you don't want to. Um, we do that appraisal right away. We get the appraisal back in typically five to seven days. We submit your loan into underwriting as quickly as we possibly can. And we're turning around loan approvals in typically one to two days. Once that loan approval comes back, it comes back with a list of items that we might need from you. An updated pay stub, a bank statement showing your earnest money deposit clearing, your earnest money is the money that you put down initially, and a few other things. We typically need your homeowner's insurance because at the time of initial approval, we don't typically have your homeowner's insurance. Once we have the clear to close, those are anyone's three favorite words in the mortgage process. The attorney, the customer, the realtor, all of those three words, clear to close. Once you're clear to close, my closing team works with your closing team, meaning your attorney, to prepare the final closing statement. Um, which you will sign, you'll bring a check to closing, your attorney will say, hey, bring a bank check or wire me the money, and you'll show up with what you need for closing that we've already prepared you for. Okay, um, home inspection versus home appraisal. Home appraisal is what we do here at Cross Country Mortgage through a third party to, to determine the value of the home. We will order your appraisal once your loan, uh, once your offer is accepted and we put you into underwriting. Your home inspection is done separately. That cost of anywhere from five to $1,500 is not part of what is due the day of closing. You would pay that to the homeowner, uh, to the inspector, right at the inspection. The home appraisal fee is collected by the appraisal management company. We order appraisals, as does every lender, through an appraisal management company, and they reach out to you for payment. Okay. Um, Closing cost breakdown, which we'll go through on your particular file when we talk, could have anything to do with your title insurance, origination fee, prepaid taxes and insurance, um, funding your escrow account, appraisal fees. Transfer taxes typically only apply um, on a buyer side in states that collect it on the buy side. For example, a transfer tax in Connecticut is paid by the seller, not by the buyer. So some states, Buyer side cost, some side, seller side cost. Recording fee, when you buy a home and close, the attorney or title company has to record in the town. Um, if you decide to pay points to buy down your interest rate, that could be a cost. And then there might be various other fees. For example, if you're buying in a condo, you would have a homeowners association questionnaire fee. We don't charge that, but the homeowners association you're buying in would charge for us to get that, that copy. Okay, I'm going to go into the Q&A to see if there's any other questions for any of you. Um, if I'm planning on purchasing a home with my partner, but plan on buying the home myself without marriage, how important is her work history if she's co-signing and paying half the down payment? Yeah, so if you're buying with anyone and they are going on the loan with you, Credit first and foremost, reminder, we are going to look at both of your credit scores and we are going to use the lower of the two credit scores. So that will affect the loan. If we don't need that person's income to qualify, let's say your income qualifies for the entire transaction, that's absolutely fine. We don't need the other person's income. However, if their debts are on the mortgage application because we pulled their credit, you would have to be able to qualify carrying your debts, their debts, and the new proposed housing payment. Okay? Um, so that, that could be something that would affect you. Um, I'm going to go through the list of attendees. Please post any additional questions. We're here at the end of the road, but I'm going to give you guys a minute while I make sure that I have everyone entered into our giveaway today. So I just want to check and see who's here 
and make sure I have everyone um, accounted for and in here. Okay. All right, so any other questions? Okay, no other questions, which is fine. What I just quickly want to remind you of before I pull um, the winner here is the market is volatile, okay? Interest rates are up higher than they've been, you know, 2020, 2021, and even the beginning of 2022. Everyone remembers a two and a half, three, three and a half percent interest rate. Guys, when I bought my first house 22 years ago, I was a bit younger, have less gray hairs, and made a bit less money than I make today. When I bought my first house 22 years ago, my rate was six and a half percent. I always tell everyone I'm still here to talk about it. Okay, so a rate that's in the six and a half percent range is not a terrible rate. The National Association of Realtors, though, does predict rates to be down to four and a half percent. So what I always say and I've said for years, find the perfect home, get the loan that comes with that home at the time, assuming you can afford it and you can always refinance later. I often say this to people, if interest rates were 0%, that would be amazing. But if the only house that was available was a real piece of junk, would you just buy it because rates were 0%? The answer is no. You buy a house based upon need, what you need to put over your head and ultimately what you like. So don't stress that rates are higher today than they have been over the last two years. They're really not that high historically. Uh, someone asked about what about assuming a mortgage? I learned about that today. Listen, if assumability was more predominant, we would probably have more inventory on the market today. There's not a lot of loans out there that are assumable. That was a thing of the past. I'm not saying it doesn't exist at all, but it's very, um, very far and few between today. There's very few lenders that will allow another consumer to assume a mortgage. Assuming a mortgage means that you're going to take over the seller's mortgage at whatever that rate is. Um, there's a lot of hiccups with assumability, and they're just really not available. But it wouldn't be a bad thing because right now our inventory is at super low levels, which is causing a lot of challenges. Guys, my team is talking to – my team is – the business that I originate personally is not the rest of my branch and the other people that work here at Cross Country Mortgage and uh, work within my team. My personal production, we are talking with about 100 clients a month, and we're pre-approving 35-ish, about 30% each month. Just imagine that times other mortgage folks that are in the market. There's a ton of buyers out there, and we are so short in inventory. Nationally, we're short about 3 million units. Okay. Does it make sense to get pre-approved for more than you may intend to spend? I would always recommend getting pre-approved for the max that you think you would buy or want to afford, even if that's not what you will buy. So if you come to me saying, I want to get pre-approved for 600000 it's not a bad idea to get pre-approved for 700000 if you qualify, because when you start looking at a $600,000 house, all of a sudden you start looking at six twenty five, six fifty, dollars and sometimes you find something in that six fifty dollars range that wasn't in the 600 range and you're willing to, to go for that 650 number, okay? So I would get pre-approved for a higher number as long as it works, as long as it works for your monthly budget and as long as you qualify for it. Okay, one more quick check here on our participants. All right, I'm gonna do the drawing for the, um, the gift bag and if they wouldn't stick together. That would be fantastic. Okay. Our winner for the, um, the gift is Jake. So Jake, you are the winner. I, um, I will get that gift to you. So congratulations. Um, anyone else who's on this call, if you did not ask a question and you want to ask me offline or later, please shoot me an email. If you're on this call, you will get our certificate so that you can present that certificate to us. Um, if you do this call prior to closing, you do get a $250 credit towards your closing costs. Um, so that's a little token of our appreciation for doing business together and also for you being on this call. Thank you very much for attending. We host this the second Tuesday of every month. So if you know a friend or family member who wants to jump on, we'd love to educate them on the process. Have a great Valentine's Day and a great Tuesday. And we look forward to speaking to you guys soon.
Thank you so much and um, have a great day. Bye-bye.